Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have a great show for you today. Egberto, you have to stop posting the videos before the show, LOL, or I have to stop watching them. Oh, my God, I didn't know that you saw them a Breach. You know, Breach, but I some of them uh, that I have today, you have not yet seen, Breach. Plus, you don't get a chance to hear our little interpretation before and after the video. But anyhow, we're going to have a great time. But look, thank you so kindly for watching all our stuff. Welcome aboard, Michael Rudden. Welcome aboard, AVQ, Breach. MCP, we are going to have fun today. We have a long show, so I'm going to have to get into it right away. As you know what broke, what broke, what broke. Anyhow, let's go ahead and start the show, then I'll start with all the videos. Anyway, liberal professor slammed on Skoros Elizabeth Roche on how to fix our democracy and more. The, this liberal professor allows, uh, shows why elitism loses elections. Elizabeth Roche makes it clear that our, de our democracy is ours, mainstream media fails again. So what are, are the four major videos, okay? It's, the professor is a prototypical liberal elitist that continuously fails the progressive movement. His support for Trump's Scotus nominee was summarily ridiculed by journalist Emily Baz Bazlan, if even in a disguised manner. The interview is a classic example of why Americans don't vote it, their interests. A Stephanopoulos follow-up question on this filibuster is another topic that we're covering today. And of course, Trump is trying to instill fear in Americans. Remember the 2016 polls, I will win. Hogwash political analyst Cornell Belcher states, political policy expert Elizabeth Roche offers compelling bipartisan insights in her new book. So those are the four topics that I kind of rushed all right into. Welcome aboard, Tia Mark. Z Arrevelo, hola, ¿cómo estás, mi amiga? Bienvenido a Politics Done Right. Anyhow, uh, we're going to start with, everybody heard the news at the, at the end of the day yesterday or somewhere during the day yesterday where it was confirmed. Donald Trump does not pay taxes. Donald Trump is a user. Donald Trump is a taker. Well, you know what? Stephanie Rule said it much better. And this is one that you haven't yet seen, my friend Bridge. So let's check it out. Actually, I think I need to cue her up and change her format. Listen to what Stephanie Rule had to say. What kinds of things would have to be done to get a tax liability down to that level? Okay, in short, Steve, the answer is no. That's the argument the president made in 2016. Listen, I'm a great business guy. I know how to optimize my taxes. You want me as your president because I'm now going to be closing those loopholes where the rich get hooked up, and I'm now going to be working for the American people. Here's the problem. There's no evidence of him doing that. And the argument that this is what all smart people do isn't true. Earlier today, I interviewed Steve Ballmer, former CEO of Microsoft, who said there's no scenario where year after year I'm paying zero zero in federal taxes. But here's an example. Ivanka Trump was a full-time employee of President Trump, yet somehow he said he paid her 700 plus thousand dollars in consulting fees for three different hotel projects. He then took that 700 odd thousand dollars and wrote it off as a business expense. That simply doesn't make sense. That's not optimizing your taxes, and we'll have to do further reporting on that. But the way that looks, at least at its surface, is fraud. So go beyond those blue states and what Jeff was talking about where, you know, it's Wall Street versus Scranton. This isn't how smart or good business people operate. This, at its surface, looks fraudulent. And I would just say one other thing. The whole idea that while in office he was going to close those loops... While in office, he expanded during those corporate tax cut business machinery expenses, meaning you could buy more equipment for your business, you'd invest it, you'd hire more people. Included in that is private planes, corporate jets. So when you look at the last couple of years and you see a spike in people buying private planes, guess why? You were able to write down the full value of that purchase. If that isn't working for the ultra elite, I don't know what is, and I, don't, I can't imagine that will play well in those deep red counties who are saying they were forgotten who's working for them. I just love that woman. Stephanie Rule, I just love that woman because she came out and said fraud. She came out and said what many won't say. This could not be anything other than fraud. So Stephanie Rule really starts to deconstruct exactly what was released on. Yes, we know he didn't pay taxes. Now let's prove that what he's doing, however, is fraud dealing. He's a thief. He's a thug. That's our president. Now Nancy Pelosi came out uh, a few, a few, 
hours later, and she said a few things that I thought uh, was, it was of interest, something that we got to see because she talks about the president's morality, but also she talks about the Supreme Court justices and why, why, why he's out there really packing the courts with the help of Mitch McConnell. Just at the morality of paying nothing for years and then paying $750 just when you're about to run for president or taking office. How does this have to have decency? This is a president who wants parades of, of military armament and, and military paying homage to him in front of the White House like he's some kind of a, a, a dictator. And yet, is he paying for any of that, the protection of our country, $750? Yeah, it's a disdain for America's working families. Uh, it's, a, it's not right. But our responsibility is to protect and defend, and we have to make sure we know what exposure the President of the United States has uh, to, and what impact it has on na national security decisions for our country. You're right, the issue of morality is a larger one, but as you began, uh, you said, let me be frank, you went through some of the other immoralities that the president has been involved in. He has a, almost a conflict of interest in how he's appointed judges who are all waiting for his cases to rise to the level of district appeals Supreme Court of the United States. One other issue that I think, again, to be verified is that the allegation that he told Mitch McConnell that the appointment of the general counsel at the IRS was more important to him to move that along more quickly than the uh, than Attorney General Barr. Connect the dots there. Connect the dots there. In other words, get that IRS guy, my IRS guy in there so that he can take care of you know, keeping my taxes on the wrap and get those judges there so that whatever doesn't get on the wraps, hey, we're taking care of them. We'll be taken care of. But look, uh, it is true, as, as Rodnan just said, they don't care about, they don't really care about Donald Trump's morality or Donald Trump doesn't care about his morality. Remember, my dear brothers and sisters, we're not trying to convince the sycophants that the cultists will take some time. That, that is for several election down the road, elections down the road when they see good progressive uh, policies come to fruition. What we are trying to do is get those people on the margins right now. And that's what this is all about. And as far as judges are concerned, the one problem that we have is when liberals kind of uh, form sort of an elite this uh, cabal, if you will, that even includes these folks that would do us harm because we're trying to form some sort of a civility. I want to see what I did up yesterday and then we'll take it on the other side. Today I was watching Farid Zakaria and I sort of got upset, perturbed actually, because there was this uh, liberal professor, his name is Noah Feldman, who wrote a column, Bloomberg, that actually stated that they should definitely go ahead and confirm Amy Coney uh, Barrett for the Supreme Court justice. And he kind of justified it saying she's very smart, she's, she believes in her values, etc., 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 which all of those may be true. But that is not the issue. What I want to do is play it here and then we'll take it on the other side. Let me ask you about Judge Barrett, presumably going to become Justice Barrett. You clerked with her on the Supreme Court. And you wrote a controversial op-ed for Bloomberg, where you're a columnist, where you said she's highly qualified to be on the court. And your basic argument was she is extremely intelligent. You said she's probably one of the two most brilliant pe uh, people in that group of law clerks. And she's a very decent person. But you disagree with her fundamentally on the law and on the Constitution. Isn't that worse, in a sense, for somebody like you? Shouldn't liberals be more terrified of a highly competent justice who will be very conservative versus somebody, you know, a little bit less competent. I think it's exactly the other way around. You know, the whole reason we have a Supreme Court is that we care about the Constitution and we resolve certain deep societal questions by asking the justices to interpret the Constitution according to their own understanding of how to do so. And you can have that done by a bunch of people who are unprincipled and who don't have deep beliefs and they just yell at each other and they vote. We have something a little bit like that. It's called Congress, you know, where it doesn't matter whether the person has good ideas and whether the person is driven by conscience. It's all supposed to be politics. But the Supreme Court stands for the idea that we should try. We need to try, even in our most contested issues, to debate and discuss it in the light of what the Constitution says and in light of what the Constitution means. And in order for us to lower the temperature a little bit in that context, 
I believe we need the smartest and best people, including the smartest and best people whom we disagree with all the way down the line. And let me be clear, Judge Barrett and I disagree on just about every important constitutional issue and most important statutory issues. But I think she's the best interlocutor that one could have under the circumstances. That's not the same thing as saying that I think she's right. When I listen to Noah talk about clerking with her, it's like hearing about someone defend uh, a member of a very fancy elite club rather than think about what Amy Barrett is actually going to do as a Supreme Court justice. So to me, the question is, what impact is she going to have? We actually know a lot about her record. Um, she has expressed interest in restricting reproductive rights, in um, potentially overturning the Affordable Care Act. And really, when you buy into the full conservative, uh, quite radical judicial agenda, you're also about fund talking about fundamentally changing the role of American government. So I'd be interested in Noah's thoughts about why he disagrees with her, because I think outlining those constitutional issues is what's really crucial here. The idea that somehow these right wingers that are very intelligent that come on to the Supreme Court on a principled constitutional basis is ridiculous. That's the difference between right wing uh, elitists and liberal elitists. And then put that in context with why progressives are unable to win based on their numbers, based on their representation in the country. Liberals like Feldman, he is completely detached from reality. Emily Bazelon, she gets it right. Farid Zakaria, he got it right. You must fear the intelligent conservative that is willing to hurt people on the Supreme Court more than you should the dumb ones. I mean, it is simple because they know how to give it the impression of credulity. They give it, they know how to make it seem legal. They make it how to seem, whenever people talk to me about the person who really wants to understand the constitution or their constitutionalist, but we may dis disagree on the, what the constitution really means, that's hogwash. The constitution is a document over 200 years written by a whole bunch of guys who only wanted to give 12% of the population population any and any sort of representation so we have to make that constitution and use that elastic constitutional clause as it is supposed to be used and that is to make life better for people in today's america not yesterday america where there were just too many people that were left without rights even with a bill of rights so let's be clear here thank you so kindly Emily Bazelon, because you have to push back against elitists like Noah Feldman who think that by speaking a certain type of legalese or a certain type of constitutional talk that somehow it means something to the people on the ground. When Republicans get their right-wingers in the Supreme Court, they're there to do one thing, destroy America by making sure that corporations get as whatever it is that they want, whether it means pilfering the environment, whether it means keeping people at people's throats by having abortion issue and many other things. So let's be real. Emlif Baslan, that is the kind of pushback we must have. Farid Zakaria doing his part, but you hit the nail on the head. Defending members of a very fancy elite club or detached from the reality of what Americans are actually going through on the ground. Now, uh, it, 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 it gets a little bit worse. Now, actually, it's good that uh, we got the pushback both from Farid Zakaria as well as we got the pushback from uh, Basil. But here's the deal. Uh, yesterday, Stephanopoulos really did something that hurts us that we have to call out all of the times. I mean, I don't think he did it on purpose, but these are things that, that journalists are supposed to be ready for. Check this out, and then we'll take it on the other side. I continuously blame the mainstream media, the MSM, for having Americans as misled as they are that gives Republicans and their policies, Republican politicians that is, and their policies plausibility because we are so bad at really informing Americans. I think many times it's by choice we get that. I want to show you uh, something that seems rather subtle, but it's real, what it, how it affects the psyche of people. Check out this interview between uh, Stephanopoulos and Mike, Senator Mike Lee, Republican. 
One of the reasons you may be able to get Judge Barrett through is because there's no filibuster now on court nominations. Yeah, no, that, that's right. On November 23rd, 2013, the Democrats voted to vitiate the filibuster on the executive calendar, referring to presidential appointments. That was an unfortunate step then. It had its natural consequences. I hope we can contain the damage so that it doesn't go on to the legislative calendar, where it would also affect changes to law. On November 23rd, 2013, the Democrats voted to vitiate the filibuster on the executive calendar, referring to presidential appointments. That was an unfortunate step then. It had its natural consequences. I hope we can contain the damage so that it doesn't go on to the legislative calendar, where it would also affect changes to law. You say you hope that you're successful on November 3rd. As you know, we just play, showed that poll showing this morning that most Americans believe that the, the, whoever wins on November 3rd should select the next Supreme Court justice. Worried at all that if you continue to push this through, there might be a backlash at the election? Now, notice that Stephanopoulos let that statement go by. The fact of the matter is that in 2017, uh, Mitch McConnell went nuclear. The, when, the, in, during the, the Obama administration, constantly the Republicans continued to block uh, Supreme uh, block judge appointments by the, President Obama. Uh, that occurred over and over again. Nothing has ever occurred like that uh, when it comes to Democrats in recent years. So they changed the rules to say, okay, everything except the Supreme Court, because of the importance of the Supreme Court, we will not mess with the filibuster as far as the Supreme Court is concerned to give everybody a better option of, of success in either appointing or not appointing a Supreme Court justice. Well, it is McConnell who changed the rules, who changed the filibuster rules to allow uh, the, the, the senators to make it on a simple one vote majority to put a Supreme Court justice up. Mike Lee gave the impression that this was done by the Democrats and Stephanopoulos did not correct him to make Americans aware that no, it is Republicans who made it that Supreme Court judges only needed a simple majority to get on board. So let's be clear here. Many times Americans uh, believe in this, uh, he said, she said, because of the way the mainstream media, uh, uh, mainstream media put things out, a false sense of equivalency, a false equivalence. False equivalence is going to kill this country if we don't start not trying to be whataboutism, not trying to have the issues uh, somehow with a false balance. Okay, last video before we go to our interview, and this one is all about, um, uh, let's just go ahead and do it because it's all referenced already. 2020 is not 2016, but 2016, the polls weren't wrong, and 2020, the polls aren't wrong. What we have to do is to make sure to get out there and vote and do what we have to do. If the uh, voters that are represented by those polls, which are pretty darn accurate, go out and execute what they said, we will have that win we've been talking about. We'll have that landslide win. Let's go ahead and listen to uh, what Belcher had to say, and then we'll take it on the other side. I mean, you look at Wisconsin, the president right now, he's, it's, that's two standard deviations outside the margin of error. But here, here's the thing, and we've talked about it a lot here. Um, we know that there are a lot of folks who, when asked by a pollster if they're going to vote for President Trump again, they'll tell a pollster no, and then they'll vote for President Trump. Uh, pollsters seem to have missed that four years ago. How real is the worry that they're missing it again this time? Hogwash. Uh, the polls in the next, the, the polls in 2016 were actually better than the polls. At least the public polls were better than the polls in, in, in 2012. The narrative was wrong, especially at the national level. The, the narrative was wrong because it was a forced two-way choice, and all these polls so so, so it showed a forced two-way choice. And in most of those polls, Hillary Clinton got to 49 or close to even 50 percent in the forced two-way choice. But it wasn't a forced two-way choice. And and the third party voting, take Wisconsin, for example. The Hillary Clinton was off of Barack Obama's margin of victory in a state like Wisconsin by almost the exact percentage points of those young Wisconsin voters voting third party. And this is important, Craig, because we're going into another election where you see a lot of young people still saying, I don't I don't like the Democrats, I don't like Joe Biden, I hate Donald Trump. And 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 thinking about third party. 
This is how Donald Trump gets to a narrow victory in these states. These young voters, particularly our young voters, have to understand, you know, Joe Biden might not be great on all your issues, but he's a lot better on your issues than, than, than Donald Trump. And the, the existential threat to, to our democracy that is Donald Trump, you do have to, in fact, make a choice between the lesser of two evils this election or our democracy might end. And that's, that's the one concern that we have, and that is to make sure to get out all our votes, have respect for all the people to make sure that we can coax them on to vote and say, this is for us all. And, you know, I sent out a newsletter a couple of days ago where I specified that to, you know, I call them my Berniaks and my lefties to go out there and, hey, guys, we have to pull this stuff down this time. The polls are accurate. They were accurate in 2016. Do not allow fear to cauterize in one's minds. Let's go ahead and get the job done because it is there to be had. The only thing that we have a president that's doing right now with the bloviation is to put that belief in your mind that look what I did in 2016. Everybody thought I couldn't do it. That's not true. Many of us wrote about the possibility of him doing exactly what he did, meaning winning in 2016 and being the disaster that he is today. Folks, go out there and vote. This thing is one in a landslide if we just uh, are respectful to all our fellow brothers and sisters, get them to the vote, and do our job. Okay, folks, uh, we're getting ready now for our interview uh, with Elizabeth Rush, but before that, we have to do our pitch real quick, so we've got to do the pitch in about two minutes. So here's the thing. Folks, you know I wrote that book called It's Worth It, How to Talk to Your Right-Wing Relatives. Your right-wing friends and your right-wing neighbors, please. The link I'm putting into the feed right now. There is a, the Amazon link. Of course, you can always go directly to our store and buy it. For those of you who buy it directly from our store, since it leaves out of here, it all comes with a signature. It comes with a, you know, I sign it. So that is how we do it. That is how we do things around here. So therefore, if you go to uh, politicsdoneright.com slash store, any books that's purchased from us directly, we sign it, we send it all signed up to you, all that good stuff. Now, please also remember what we need quite a bit of are YouTube subscribers. And remember on October 3rd, we are going to go ahead and uh, I actually, you know what? I just noticed that it says an X4. It didn't, it didn't transmit it to YouTube for some reason, but it transmitted it to the, all the other networks. Uh, we are also... Um, have the link in there for YouTube if you want to subscribe to YouTube, politicsdoneright.com slash YouTube. That is a very excellent and very super, super, super inexpensive way to say, yes, I want to help to support independent media that's going to bring you other analysis other than the mainstream media and that's out there doing the work. We don't only do politics done right. If you go to egbertowillies.com, you see a lot of the stuff that we write as well as the books that we have specifically as I see it, class warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom, which you can get at Amazon as well as on politicsandright.com slash store. And, oh, and, and the new book, which is It's Worth It. Please, please go ahead. And it would be nice if you get them both, you know, but go to politicsandright.com slash store or go to Amazon and get the book. I have the link in there so that you can join us on YouTube. Uh, if you join us on YouTube... Uh, you, there are other perks that we provide there as well. So please consider doing that. Uh, alternatively, you can provide us support via PayPal, which is at politicsdoneright.com slash PayPal, or you know, any one of the PayPal things you can just go ahead and send to our Politics Done Right. Um, you know, everything that we do is to either label Politics Done Right or label Egberto Willis. We do need your support. So please consider giving us your support. That is how we can stay doing what we do. This is 16 hours a day, seven days a week. So uh, we really believe in what we're doing. We love what we're doing. Uh, I can tell you, I love doing this. I love writing the blogs. I love finding out the news. I love this uh, uh, dissecting the news because you really feel that you're doing something that is important and you're adding value to not only what the mainstream media does. The mainstream media does have their limitations, but we can go beyond those. Anyhow, it is time for our interview with Elizabeth Rush. Stay tuned. 
Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Radamic. Berto Willis, your host. We're, we're here with Elizabeth Rush. It, she's an award-winning author of more than 20 books, which have received multiple starred reviews from Publisher Weekly, Kirkus, Horn Book, Booklist School, Library Journal, and BCB, among others. Her work has won the Golden Kite Award, the Subaru Prize, the Cook Prize, the Green Earth Award, and the Oregon Book Award. I'm getting tired saying this, and has landed on many notable best uh, best lists. Uh, she's written for one of my favorite uh, rags. Uh, she's also an author of more than a hundred articles and publications such as the New York Times, Smithsonian Harper, Backpacker, Merkin Craft, What We Love Here, Mother Jones, and Portland Monthly, among many others. She has a bachelor's in economics from Duke University, a master's in public policy from the University of California, Berkeley, and has served as a Jacob K. Javis fellow in the U.S. Senate. She visits schools across the country and speaks widely on the topics of writing, teen activism, science heroes, and much more. And now she has a new book. You call this democracy? Welcome aboard, Elizabeth. Uh, How are you doing? (laughs) I'm great. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Absolutely. I mean, when I saw the title of your book, I said, you know, this is the time. And it's amazing that you are on today, given what has occurred over the last two days. So before we even get started about why you wrote the book and all that good stuff, what are your thoughts on, uh, on, on the president's latest utterings? Well, um, his utterings really concern me, um, especially his utterings about democracy and about handing over power, and especially about vote by mail. He's really undermining uh, the faith um, of citizens in our in our elections. Um, I am from Portland, Oregon, which has had vote by mail since 2000. Mm -hmm. It's very well researched. There have been, you know, infinitesimal amounts of voter fraud with vote by mail. You know, one message I really want to get across is it is safe to vote by mail. It is safer than going to the polls and standing in line with people who may or may not have COVID. It's a proven practice that's been used in this country for a long time. I'm actually really glad that 83% of Americans now have access to vote by mail. It's the most respectful way that, um, that our government can set up elections so that people can vote without worrying about, you know, getting sick and dying, or even, you know, who's going to take care of their kids or their elder care, or do they need to take time off work? So, um, yeah, it, it's, it, you know, I, I'm really worried about how he's undermining um, our faith, citizens' faith in the system. Um, and I really want to send the message to citizens that, you know, vote by mail is 100% safe. It is you know, virtually broad free, there's all kinds of protections. And, you know, uh, this election is really important. And one thing also that I want to say is that it may take longer for, um, for ballots to be counted, the vote by mail ballots to be counted. And that's okay. That doesn't mean our system's not working. We should be patient and make sure that all votes are counted um, so that our elections can truly um, pick the next president. You know, I was very concerned about that initially because, as it turns out, what it what happened is I couldn't imagine why the president was so concerned about vote by mail. And so I said, I wonder if there's something with machines being rigged and he's scared that vote by mail has, since it has traceability, that it's a problem. So I called up Greg Palast. I don't know if you know who Greg Palast is from. Uh, he is the voter in, voting expert here in the country. So I mm-hmm. called up and I said, is there something? With, and he said, no, the president just knows that if vote by mail is effective, he's definitely going to lose. And that's why he wants to do that. You know, I don't even know if that's true. I mm-hmm. actually think that uh, that President Trump it may be a little bit misled about vote by mail. Um, there are a lot of older people who tend to vote um, Republican who would like to be able to vote by mail and feel confident and feel safe about it. It is not at all uh, a, a done deal that voting by mail is going to turn the election over to a Democrat. Um, the reason we have elections is so that people can express their will. And in every election, we don't know what that will is. And like golly, I want to know what every voter thinks. And I think vote by mail can help us do that and really make sure that the election reflects the will of the people. So in yeah. a way, he's sort of, it's, it's sort of a, 
um, a lack of confidence in on his part that in a way that he's afraid to find out if we really get as many people voting as possible who they want. And well, um, well, the I would truth recommend that, that he try to be more confident and let us vote and let us pick the next president. Well, well the polls are, you know, people kind of have are concerned with the polls. I have never been concerned with the polls because even in during the Hillary Clinton episode, the polls came within the margins of error. Most of them did. So, I mean, it's not like the polls were wrong. It's just that uh, the, the enthusiasm and the, the poll directionality and all of that is what made the difference in that election. But let's, let's talk about what we really want to talk about. And that is your new book. You call this democracy. Why did you decide to write this book? Although I think it's apropos. Yeah, well, I'm frustrated um, with our government, with our elections, and people are frustrated with our government and elections. And I think that there is a real reason behind that frustration. And I really wanted to create a book that would take a hard look at our election processes and figure out um, what's working and in what ways are we actually undermining our the principle of democracy, which is one person, one vote, and having the elections reflect the will of the people. So I look at um, aspects like um, the electoral college, like automatic voter registration, like gerrymandering, and I try to, um, you know, illuminate how those those strange structures affect our democracy and what people can do about them. Now, now you created along with this book, and this is something that you don't see often, a very well integrated website. And this website has a report card, a 50-state democracy report card. Please tell us about that. First of all, tell us how people get there. Tell us what's the purpose of it. And tell us what you expect to, to teach, us at that, teach us out of that and what you expect from us out of that. Yeah. So when I was writing You Call This Democracy, I broke down um, everything into chapters and each, each issue was covered in a chapter. So I had electoral college and gerrymandering and voter suppression and vote by mail. And it's interesting when I was writing, I have a master's in public policy. When I was writing it, I was thinking, I wonder how things work in my state in Oregon. I'm a pretty well-informed person, but I didn't know how Oregon fared on all of these issues. And so I thought, you know, people, so many of these, um, these issues, the ways that elections are run happens at the state level. And I thought that people would want to find out how their state fares. And so I collected um, data on all of the issues that I talk about in my book. And, um, and I, and I uh, broke them down by state, and I created a report card so that anyone in the country. So you're in Texas. Is that right? Yes, I am. Yeah. So you can go, you can click on Texas and you can see, okay, so has Texas passed the um, national popular vote interstate compact? Well, no, Texas has not. You know, does Texas have gerrymandering, you know, or is there an independent, independent citizen committee that draws the voting maps? Well, in Texas, um, uh, you, do, no. you, you do have gerrymandering. We have um, big gerrymandering, yes. Big gerrymandering. In Texas, do you have um, automatic voter registration? You don't have automatic voter registration. So these are all very specific things that are happening in, in, in your state um, that are standing in the way of elections really representing the will of the people. So what I'm hoping that citizens will do is I hope they'll read You Call This Democracy and really understand why these structures and, and, and elements of our democracy are so important and how um, if we don't get it right, our elections do not reflect the will of the people. And I hope that they will go to um, the website, which is called youcallthis.com and click on the 50 state democracy report card and click on their state and read through, you know, what issues, what, what things do I need to do in my state to have democracy um, work better in my state? And um, there are more resources on the website that include kind of how to get involved, which organizations are working on these different issues. There's even model legislation that you can send to your state legislature, uh, legislators. Um, there's even a way for you to find out who your state legislators are so that you can email them or write them a letter and say, 
you know what? I think the U.S. president should be elected by a national popular vote. There's this movement across the country, 15 other states have passed the national popular vote in their state compact. You know, you're saying that. I want this passed. I want this passed in, in, uh, in Texas, too. Uh, that is important. I, I want uh, you to please explain the national popular vote because a lot of people don't realize that there is a there is a constitutional way that we can prevent the, the ills that occurred in 2000 and 2016. Explain yeah. that, please. Yes. Well, so actually 15 times in, in our country's history, the person who won the national popular vote did not take the presidency. Because wait, 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 wait. Did you say 15? Uh, I mean, five times. I'm oh, sorry, okay. Five times. <laughs> okay. Five times. Yes. Five times. Yes, you five scared times. me about the, uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, five times in our nation's history. Um, so um, the electoral college um, is the way that it's set up. Each state has a certain number of electors. And in, in, in each state, that state adds up the popular vote in their state. And whoever wins the popular vote in that state gets all of the electors. So even if it's like 51% versus 49%, all of those electors go to the person who won in that state. And so that system really distorts, um, you know, uh, what the people want. I, I read a recent study from National Popular uh, um, um, NPR that said that uh, someone could win the presidency with only a quarter of the national popular vote. Yes. Now, the interesting thing is that the U.S. Constitution, um, you know, created the, the, um, the electoral, electoral college, college, but it also creates a way out. So the U.S. Constitution says that each state shall figure out how to, um, how to choose its electors. So that leaves the door open for states to decide to give their electors to the winner of the national popular vote. So that means that, you know, every election is added up anyway. We know what the national popular vote is. And, um, and states can agree, can sign this interstate national popular vote compact, and they can agree that their electors will go to the winner of the national popular vote. Now, there are already 15 states representing 194 out of 270 electors needed to win. So we're actually really close to, if, if, if you know, a few more states, and especially states like Texas with a lot of electors, if they sign on to the Interstate National Popular Vote Compact, we could move to a national popular vote. And finally, we can elect our president ourselves. We don't need you know, electors appointed by political parties to pick our president for us. We elect people in 5,000 other offices in this country by a direct vote, and we should do it with the president's presidency as well. Ironically, what's interesting is in 2000, I believe the Supreme Court made, uh, uh, actually came out and pointed out that, in fact, the con that the that the state houses that uh, could actually do exactly that. In 2000, because they thought they may have needed it for Florida, it, to, to go uh, ahead and say that the the elector, uh, or rather the legislature, can go ahead and assign the electors, and that you know, which means that it's already passed constitutional muster. That's right. That's right. And so this is something that we can do. I think what something that people may not appreciate about the electoral college is the way in which it really does distort our elections. So in 2020, there are about you know, six battleground states. And um, those states tend to get all or most uh, visits from the candidates, but they also get more federal funding. They also get more disaster relief. Um, and they also get the candidates to listen to what they care about. That's only six states. So 44 other states, the spectator states, we just watch and and we don't really have a say and the candidates really have no incentive to care about what's happening um, in our states. And that's a real distortion of the will of the people and um, and of how elections should run. That, that, that is a that is a complete shame. Now, um, when you when you wrote this book or for, let me back up, how did you just release the book now or has it been out for quite a while? Yeah, so the book came out um, March 30th, which you may remember is right when the coronavirus was heating mm. up. And, uh, you know, nobody really wanted to hear about or cover anything but the pandemic, including me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So what I've done is I, I'm sort of relaunching the book. I, I gave it some time, let things settle down. The election season is heating up. And I think that these issues are really relevant. They're, they're also relevant because some of the issues that I write about are on ballots um, in different states. And so I would also like citizens to know about, you know, to find out, is there a measure on the ballot about gerrymandering? Um, is there a measure on the ballot about the national popular vote? You know, there are things other than the presidential election that can really affect how our, uh, how our country runs. Now, there, you know, there, a lot of folks would ask, is your book an ideological book? And in scanning the book, I found that it didn't really cover issues that, uh, you know, I mean, I think you're, you're re- you're, this is a book that's really a democracy book. In other words, the will of the people, whatever the will of the people may be. Do I get that right? Did I see that? Yes. And, and, and I, I also um, made a real effort for it to be nonpartisan. Um, I looked at issues simply through the lens of um, one person, one vote, every citizen having an equal voice. And one of the things that was actually quite helpful is that I found that there's a fair amount of agreement among Democrats and Republicans about these issues. Um, you know, Republicans gerrymander and so do Democrats, and Republicans want to fix gerrymandering and so do Democrats. So what I like about the book and what I like about the ideas in it is that, you know, there are things in here that 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 a vast majority of Americans agree upon. And that's rare <laughs> in this time of hyperpartisanship. But I think that if we can pay attention to those areas of agreement, make change in those areas of agreement, we can have a much more smoothly functioning democracy that can then help us really move forward on issues like climate change, police brutality, um, health care. You know, until our, our representatives really reflect the will of the people, we're not going to make progress on those issues. We really need the will of the people to make progress on those issues. Now, interestingly, when we talk about partisanship, uh, first of all, do we still need parties? You know, I struggled about whether to cover parties in the book. Um, I did not. I, I decided not to include or kind of take apart the whole two-party system because I really wanted to focus on the kind of the smaller changes that could have a really big impact. You know, I think that, you know, changing to a national popular vote, turning over the drawing of voting district maps to citizens rather than politicians, um, instituting state nationwide automatic voter registration. Let's get those 50 million people who are not registered to vote on the voter rolls, you know, making sure everyone has access to easy voting. So these are, these are things that I don't think there's a lot, there, there has, doesn't sort of have to be a lot of debate about. We can just make these things happen and, and things will work more smoothly. Whereas I feel like kind of taking on the two-party system um, is a, a bit of a bigger issue. I wanted to give um, a pathway to change that we could follow right now. And, and that makes sense. In other words, uh, you want to bite what you know you can handle right now, and then later on that may be another battle. Because the reason I ask that, because when we talk about hyper-partisanship, right, um, it, it's interesting because the kind of dialogues that I have, I sit down with people at first without uh, trying to get them not to assume what my ideological bent is. And interestingly, uh, the things that I support are the things that most people support. In other words, uh, whether irrespective of party. But a lot of the things that we don't support, irrespective of party, are several times, or, or many times, the things many of the parties both support. Okay, in, in other words, you will find that the, the both parties support certain policies that, let's say, work with, uh, with corporations, while yeah. neither Republicans or Democrat, d- Democratic people, the rank and file, do. So uh, many times you find the people have more in common uh, than the separation in parties would indicate, and you'd find that the folks on the top have more in common that don't apply to any of the people below them. Have you seen that? Have you noticed that? Yeah, well, so with that example that you give, what I would say is that there's something else going on here. There's a reason why Democrats and Republicans are both interested in what corporations want and think. And that's because running an election is very expensive. 
and um, and they need donations to run their campaigns. And this is a, a chapter in one of my book. I, bought, I talk about the power of money in elections. And again, there are simple things we can do, like limit donations, um, individual do- donations, and bar corporations from making donations to campaigns at all. And there are, you know, all kinds of things we can do anti-corruption wise, um, kind of ending the, the revolving door of you know, representatives becoming lobbyists. Um, so, you know, we can fix some things within the system to actually um, uh, uh, decrease the role of money in policymaking and in campaigns. And by doing that, I think what we'll do is we'll end up giving more power to ordinary Americans and ordinary citizens, because those votes then are going to matter to the representatives. Yeah, one, one, I mean, that's, the, you know, we, we've been working on getting money out of politics for a long time. In fact, uh, uh, Citizens United, McCutcheon, all these particular um, Supreme Court rulings that pretty much made our vote purchasable, if you will, or the vote of the politicians purchasable. But, um, you you give a lot of classes. You have all you have a lot of classes on YouTube. You have a lot of classes at what you call a flash course on democracy. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so flash course on democracy was actually inspired by a little bit by COVID. I have a son who is in film school um, at Chapman University and came home in the spring um, because of COVID. So I had a filmmaker at home. And I had a book that kind of disappeared a bit because of the pandemic. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to find other ways to get these ideas out. I really believe in the ideas. I really believe that we can make our government and our elections work more smoothly if people just were more aware of what these kind of weird structures are and how to fix them. And so he and I collaborated together on these flash course for on democracy videos. So they're little short, like five minute kind of fun videos. One is on um, the Electoral College, one is on gerrymandering, one is on vote by mail. Um, And I take information from the book and um, just kind of really hit it really fast and fun. Um, They're kind of like, I don't know if you've ever seen the crash course, John Green has, has these flash courses on history. So it's kind of after that model. So there, it's just another way, a fun way to um, to spread awareness about some of these issues. I hope it's the kind of thing that can be used, you know, when kids are, you know, at home, flipping through YouTube, or teachers can also assign them to, you know, have a really fun way to engage young people in, in these elections. Now, the thing about it, you say, well, COVID kind of, uh, th- th- as far as your book is concerned, COVID kind of put a little thing on it. Actually, the, the good thing about this book is this book is pretty much timeless, you know, until we get the compact done, until we get all these lists of things done. I mean, right now I'm looking at the Texas, um, our, your website and where Texas is ranked, and we are a spectator state, 54% of Texans don't vote, which I think you are being very generous when you say 54% of Texans don't vote. I think uh, that... 54 percent that's probably in a good year <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, it's a presidential election so that's yeah. actually the highest possible but still we're all failing every stage is failing. right and it's interesting because uh texas you gave a d minus that is horrendous this is a big state i mean in fact we are not we are actually a non-vote you know we, we the, the way we are moving the vote in texas this going forward is we're telling folks that we're a non-voting state and think about what could happen if we ever started voting right right well things like i mean think about what if texas had automatic voter registration that's the number one reason non-voters don't vote if they're not registered so what if texas registered everybody what if instead of having uh you know i think you have vote by mail, but only with a very specific excuse, and COVID isn't even a legitimate excuse. It's not a legitimate excuse, even though they're saying if you can prove that uh, somehow you shouldn't go because you have a pre, you know, they may give you a break. But very, but very, very narrow. So if right. you had, if you had um, automatic vote by mail, automatic voter registration, if you had, if you signed on to the National Popular Vote Compact, if your um, voting districts were drawn fairly so that people felt like their votes were going to matter. It didn't matter where they lived and that their votes were going to be kind of twisted around by the politicians who were drawing the voting district maps. Like, think about the voice that Texas could have 
in the country. It's a big state as we said, with a lot of people in it. And I'm curious, what you know, what does Texas have to say? We don't actually know what Texas has to say. That is so true. Voting. I don't know what Texas thinks. And sadly, the people that need to vote are the ones that are not voting here in Texas. And that is why we have things like the worst uh, health insurance uh, uh, in rate and why health wise we're in. Anyhow, that's that that's uh, that's another story. Now, um, two more questions or, or rather one more question. And then I'm going to ask you to tell me what I didn't ask you. Um, how do you feel about 2020? How do I feel about 2020? So if you're talking about the election, um, I... There are the, whole, the whole picture. Oh, the election, the whole, the whole picture, picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, 2020. It's a tumultuous, interesting, horrifying time. I think that sometimes we need to be shaken up. Um, in order for change to happen. I think that we have to be pulled out of our comfort zone in a way that makes us look at what's going on. You know, why are we having wildfires? Why are we having raging hurricanes? Why are we having protests in the streets? You know, I think it is a time when we, we can look at those specific issues or we can step back and say, okay, what is happening in our system? What's happening in the bigger picture that might be underlying all of this? And that's one of the things that I was trying to do with my book, We Call This Democracy, is look behind climate change and peace brutality and healthcare and all those issues that we're, that we're, we're struggling with now and say, maybe there are some of these other things happening that if we fix them, we could make progress on climate change. We could make progress on healthcare. We can make progress on police brutality. So... You know, as difficult as 2020 is, it could be a wake-up call. It could be what we need to really look at things differently in a structural way. I think you're so right, and I think what it I think it's humbling because uh, whereas we've been the country that look at the other countries around the world as basket cases, it's amazing if you go to the EU or or if you go to Central America, we are now the basket case. And uh, we are the ones that supposedly lead democracy around the world. And we are showing that even our constitution has some flaws that need some, that need some sort of correcting if we are to be a real democracy. Now, Elizabeth, what didn't I ask you that you wished I had asked? I think I would love to talk a little bit about what citizens can actually do here. So I talk about a a lot of big issues like go to college, gerrymandering, automatic vote by mail, you know, all these kind of big, big issues. So what does that mean for citizens? So, of course, the simple thing is register and vote. Um, The other thing, though, is um, also talk to people around you and make sure they're registered and that they vote, especially young people. We've learned that young people um, often need that extra nudge to to register, to make sure they're up to date and to get voting. But I'd like you to take it a little bit further. Instead of just thinking about the presidential election, I'd like you to think about what's happening at your state level. I'd like you to really care about your state legislatures, find out who they are, find out what they stand for, find out what they think about national, about the national popular vote, what they're doing about gerrymandering, what they're doing about automatic voter registration, The state level is somewhere where we can really have an impact. State legislatures want to know what their constituents think. And that leads me to kind of my last piece of advice is, I wish that we would all become what I call cell phone citizens. So that means that um, every citizen in the United States has five representatives whose job it is to represent you. So I'm talking about your two senators and your one representative. Um, on the federal level, and then your um, state legislature, your two state legislatures, kind of a senatorial one and kind of a representative type one. So I would like you to take, you know, the five or 10 minutes that it takes to find their contact information, put it in your phone, put their phone number and their email address in your phone, and tell them what you think. Learn about these issues, Write them about vote by mail, about automatic voter registration, about um, national popular vote, about gerrymandering, and about any issue that you care about. Our democracy only functions when there is a voice, when we are using our voice to tell our representatives what we think. And I believe that if we did that, we could make huge changes at the state level, which would make our democracy function more smoothly 
and finally have our laws reflect the will of the people. Elizabeth, that advice about putting those five people in your phone is perfect. That is what everybody needs to do. Elizabeth Rush, author of You Call This Democracy? Folks, let's learn about our democracy. Let's go ahead and get that. Thank you so kindly for having been with us, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for having me and keep up the the wonderful work. That is a great book that Elizabeth actually wrote. You guys should check that out. Uh, look, man, um, we are close to the end of the show. Um, I, I actually timed it perfectly this time. I cannot believe it. I cannot believe it. Hey, guys, um, let me welcome all my great folks here. Bridge MCP, welcome aboard. Michael Rodnan, welcome aboard. Zen Anderson, welcome aboard. Uh, let's see who else is here with us. I saw... Uh, I, let's see, I'm scrolling down, a lot of messages, uh, Bruce Pollard, welcome aboard, Norman Reynolds, welcome aboard, scrolling down, I don't see any more, let's see who else here, I know I saw quite a bit more coming, a lot of messages, so if I miss you, please forgive me, uh, scrolling in, scrolling in, scrolling in, uh, Tia Marge Z. Arrivello, welcome aboard, uh, Jackie Odell, welcome aboard, uh, let's see who else did I miss. If I missed you, just drop me a line at the bottom and I'll be, I'll definitely call you out. Anyhow, we are at the end of the program, folks. I thank you so kindly for being here with me. I know that there are millions of other places that you could be. I know that you could be at any other, any other program, any other website, any other thing and that you're here with me. I'm honored. So thank you so kindly for being here. Please remember to go ahead if you have the wherewithal. I got to write in the book a few weeks ago. It's worth it. Uh, so please go ahead and get It's Worth It. Please get the book. It's Worth It. I promise you you're going to like that read. Uh, how to talk to your right-wing relatives, neighbors, and friends. And guess what? It doesn't have an expiration date on this book. Check it out because I'm, I'm sure you'd like it. And please, again, consider joining our YouTube, uh, our YouTube posse. Just go to politicsdoneright.com slash YouTube, politicsdoneright.com slash YouTube, and patron. We need more patrons. We need 1,000 patrons. I think we're about 133 right now. We need 1,000 to, be, to, be, uh, to, to remain viable. Right now, we are overextended to do what we know is right to do. Uh, you can also support us at PayPal at politicsdoneright.com slash PayPal. Bree says, Egberto, my brother is hooked now hooked on you. Tell your brother I love him too. And come and do some talking online. And by the way, people, I, I want to tell you uh, a few things. I bring a lot of folks onto the show, right? But I always tell you guys that the show is yours. And I really mean that. If anybody wants to be uh, on, on the show to, for an interview to talk about real life, because that is what we want to show people, right? Real life. Real people. What's really happening. If you want to uh, do a little five or ten minute segment with me, drop me a line and we'll talk about it. We'll zoom a 10, 15 minute segment or whatever. I want to see everybody have a voice. That is what this is all about. Everybody having a voice. And a voice that can be promoted everywhere. Because that is what's missing in our democracy. Our democracy, we have assigned certain people to be the ones who we listen to. What I do believe is that what we are supposed to be, a window to us all. I really want you to start thinking that way because what happens is when we have learned this hierarchical way of being, it for all practical purposes has put many of us in our places. And you know where our places are? A collective. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you know how I end this, baby. I am what? Out! We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. 
Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.